On January 20th, 1936, King George V of England passed away, and his son, Prince Edward VIII, became the king of the British Empire. And King Edward's rule was problematic because he was having an affair with Wallace Simpson, and Wallace Simpson was an American woman who had been divorced and was in the process of a second divorce. She was a socialite who partied hard and was known as a gold digger. Well, the problem occurred uh, when King Edward told his government officials that he loved Mrs. Simpson and he was going to marry her uh, once her second divorce had become final. Needless to say, this became quite a stir uh, in the English government and society at large. Never before had a king married a twice-divorced woman, let alone an American. So scandalous, was humiliating. So the government said to uh, Edward, uh, and if he married Mrs. Simpson, they said, we'll all resign. Well, they gave him a second option, and that was that if he really wanted to marry her, then he had to step down from the throne, he had to abdicate his throne. They did not believe, uh, they did not believe that he loved her to the point of losing the most prestigious uh, position in all the world, which is, of course, the king of the British Empire. They didn't think he'd do it. They didn't think he'd resign. They didn't think he'd let them step down. But Edward did the unbelievable. After being king for only 327 days, he abdicated his throne, thus becoming the only British monarch ever to resign voluntarily. He gave up all the honor, the prestige, the glory, the tradition, and all of that stuff that came with being the king of the empire to marry Wallace Simpson. You see, that one act, that one event revealed to all the world Edward's love for Wallace. That one event authenticated his love for her over all else. Well, today we come to remember and celebrate an event that does just that, an event that legitimizes and authenticates and proves and reveals the greatest claim ever made. And that, of course, is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, from Romans chapter 1, verse 4, I'd like to consider two things that the resurrection reveals. And if you've got a bulletin, it'll be on the back of that bulletin. And that is the resurrection reveals Jesus' sonship, Secondly, the resurrection reveals Jesus' power. And so let me read verses 1 to 4 again, concentrating on verse 4. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Well, one of the most common errors and heresies concerning Jesus Christ is his person. Who is he? Who is he? Right? And 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 this has been going on for centuries and was clearly an issue even while he was here and walked on this earth. Over and over again, he told the Jews that he was the Son of God and that he was the Son of Man. Now, they really didn't understand what the Son of Man meant, but they hated the claim that he called himself the Son of God. Right? And remember, after he healed the man by the pool of Bethesda, it was on the Sabbath day, he said in John 5.17 to the Jews at that point who wanted to kill him for healing on the Sabbath day, he said, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. And this infuriated the Jews even more. And so we read in verse 18, therefore... The Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. In John 10, 30, read today but not seen, he said, I and my father are one. Then in verse 31, we read the Jews' reaction to this statement. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus responded with a, with a fact And then with a question, in verse 32, he said, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And in verse 33, right, shows us the magnitude of Jesus' claim. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Why? And because you, being a man, make yourself God. You make yourself God. After he healed the man born blind in John 9, He asked him this question in verse 35. He goes, do you believe in the Son of God? 
Do you believe in the Son of God? To which the man responded in verse 36, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe him? And Jesus says in verse 37, he says, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. A clear declaration from Jesus' lips that he is the Son of God. But if untrue, then they were claims worthy of death. In John 6, 38, Jesus said he came down from heaven, that he was sent here by the Father, again, claiming to be the Son of God. So the Jews hated him because of who he claimed to be, and they understood who he was claiming to be. It was a claim that no one would ever dare make, a claim that was heretical because it was a claim saying, you are God. In Matthew 26, 63, at the the trial of Jesus, the high priest Caiaphas says to Jesus, he asks him, he says, tell us, tell us if you are the Christ, are you the son of God? And Jesus says in verse 64, he says, it is as you said, yes, I am. Then in verse 65, we read, the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. In John's account, of the trial of Jesus in John 19, 6 and 7, the Jews dragged Jesus before Pilate. But Pilate cannot find any fault in Jesus. So Pilate says to the Jews, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die. Here's why. Because he has made himself to be the Son of God. That's it. So Jesus was was claiming, right? What he was claiming is is not to be the offspring of God. He's not created by God, but he is God. He's saying, I am God. I am eternal God. And therefore, I have all the attributes of God, right? He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is God in the flesh. And he could have not have been more clear of who he was than when he said in John 8, 55, when he said to the Jewish leaders, most assuredly, I say to you, I am. I am. And what I am is, is the title that Jehovah or Yahweh or God said of himself. Said of himself, taking this title of God himself in Exodus 3, 13 and 14. When Moses says, who do I say is sending me? The Jews are going to reject me. Say, I am is sending you. Right? And that means the eternal one. The self-existent one. He's saying, I am the eternal, self-existent God. And to the Jews, that was blasphemy. And to the Jews, there was only one God. Right? Deuteronomy 6, for hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Is one. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God before me. 2 Samuel 7.22, David said, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you. In Joel 2.27, God says himself, And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So as far as the Jews were concerned, no one else could be God. No one else could be God. No one else could share his attributes. And Jesus, claiming to be God, infuriated them. And they could not stomach such a claim. For them, there was only one God. And the idea of a plurality in the Godhead, that's blasphemous. And the verse that they're citing for blasphemy, that's Leviticus 24, 16, which said, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And calling yourself the Son of God and equal to God was blaspheming the name of God. Well, not only did Jesus claim to be the Son of God, but others claimed it for him as well. John the Baptist claimed it in John 134 when he said, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Nathaniel claimed it in 1 John 49. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Peter claimed it in John 6.69. He said, also we have come to believe and we know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They knew it. Martha claimed it in John 11.27. 
before the raising of Lazarus, she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. I believe it. The disciples claimed it. Matthew 14, 33. Right? Then, then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. The centurion who stood by the cross, he claimed it as well in Matthew 27, 54. Truly, this was the Son of God. Apostle John claimed it in John 20, 31, when he's giving, his, 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 he's giving us the, the purpose, the mission statement of writing the gospel of John. He says in John 20, 31, but these things are written, I've written this gospel. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The reason I wrote it is so you would know it and you would believe it and be saved because of it. The angel Gabriel claimed it in Luke 1.35 when he came to Mary and said, listen, man, you're going to marry, you're going you're gonna to give birth to the Messiah. There we read, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Satan, Satan knew it. He claimed it in a backhanded way. In a backhanded way, right? In in. In, in Matthew 4, 3, he said, if you are the son of God, right, make these stones bread. Well, he knows he's the son of God. Listen, the demons claimed Jesus was the son of God. In Luke 4, 41, and the demons also came out, and the demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the son of God. They knew. Jesus said that even the very works he did the very works he did, the miracles proclaimed that he was the son of God. In, Matt, in John 10, 38, he said, though you do not believe me, believe the works, believe the miracles, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. In other words, I'm doing things no one else can ever do, has ever done. Only the Messiah can do these things. And the end all of all, all endorsements, the end all of all endorsements, comes from God the Father himself at Jesus' baptism. In Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And again at the transfiguration in Matthew 17, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now what all of these were claiming was something unbelievable and unheard of, something high and lofty. But the resurrection, it proved it. It proved it. Paul says in Romans 1, 1, 4, that the resurrection declared it. It's a declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. And the word declared means to mark out or to mark out definitely. So what Paul is actually saying is the resurrection conclusively and irrefutably marks out Jesus as the Son of God. No question about it. No question about it. He is the God-man. You know, a person can claim to be a millionaire, but his bank book will mark out, will mark out if he really is a millionaire. A person can claim to be an honor roll student, but their grades will mark out if they are an honor roll student. So about 10 years ago, my mother's visiting us from, from Florida. And for some reason, she believes I was an honor roll student in, in high school. <laughs> I never said that. I never came close to being that. And so she's going on to my wife and daughter about how smart I was and I was an honor roll student. And I don't say anything because I know they know that I wasn't. And my, my daughter runs upstairs, goes into a cabinet, and pulls up my high school transcripts. And she brings them downstairs in front of my mother, and my mother says, I thought you were an honor roll student. I said, I never said that, Ma. You see, my high school transcripts marked out that I was not an honor roll student. The resurrection authenticates and marks out and proves Jesus' claims. They wipe out every question every concern, every doubt. Listen, the Old Testament prophets, they did miracles by the power of the Spirit, and some of those miracles are pretty amazing. 
But none of the prophets claimed that they were the Son of God. And none of the prophets died again, died and rose again. The resurrection is airtight and absolute proof that Jesus is the Son of God, of his identity. Now we may ask the question, why is it so important that Jesus be the Son of God? Couldn't, couldn't he just be an angel or a created being as so many in our day think? Well, the answer is emphatically no, no. He had to be the Son of God. He had to be the Son of God. No mere man or created being would be qualified to mediate between God and man. No man could do that. Only someone who is infinite God could stand before infinite God and mediate for us. Also, only the Lord can give salvation, for salvation is of the Lord, we read in Jonah 2.9. Therefore, no angel could save us. No spirit being could save us. No created holy man could save us. But only God himself in the flesh could save us. The Puritan William Whitaker said this. He said, had Jesus not been truly God, he would not have been qualified for such a high task. For it was God that had been offended and infinite, an infinite majesty that had been despised. Therefore, the person mediating must, ha must have some equality with him to whom he mediates. If the whole society of angels mediated on man's behalf, it would have been too little. But one Christ was infinitely more than all, and that's because he was truly God. In other words, to mediate, to stand before us and God, no man could do that, because no man could stand before an infinite God. But the God-man could, because he's still infinitely God, right? So the resurrection proves his person and his work, and it proves that God was satisfied with that work, right? Which atoned for the sins of all his people. That's why we read in Romans 8.33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Who, who, who? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes an accession for us. Who could charge anything against you once Christ has saved you? He's risen. He has all power and authority. He's not a dead religious guy. He's a reigning king. Listen, no resurrection, no son of God. No son of God, no payment for sin, no atoning for sin, no satisfaction for sins paid for at the cross, and no satisfaction for sins paid at the cross, then Jesus' blood, insufficient, insufficient, insufficient to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And listen, then no place prepared for us in heaven. No place prepared for us in heaven. Nor will he come back for us and take us to himself, but rather we go to the lake of fire prepared for the devil and the demons. Nor could we ever know the abundant life, but rather we would know death. Nor would there be Christianity or church at all. You see, there's an awful lot riding on the resurrection of Christ. Now, because Jesus is the Son of God, that necessitates a few things. And the first is that it authenticates it authenticates every single word he ever said. Right? As the Son of God, which he is the Son of God, he is also the truth, and he cannot lie. Every word he said was true. Every prophecy he gave will come to pass. Every command he issued must be obeyed. The Father said of him, again in Luke, Matthew 17, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But it doesn't stop there. Hear him, meaning obey him. Hear him. He said in Matthew 4, 17, he said, you must repent. You will never see the kingdom of God unless you repent. He said in Matthew 4, 19, follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, to rejoice when you are persecuted for his sake, rejoice. He said, let your light shine before men. He said, be reconciled to your brother. He said, don't lust. 
He said you have to keep your word, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He told us to love our enemies, to lay up treasures in heaven. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. He told us not to cast our pearls before swine. He said, ask, seek, and knock, and keep praying. He told us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. He told us not to fear man, but rather fear God. He said to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He told us to take his yoke and to deny ourselves and to pick up our crosses and to follow him. He said beware of covetousness. He said honor marriage, be a servant. He told us to believe in him, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And he said I'm the only way to the Father. Any other way is going to end up short. The point is every word of God is pure and perfect and is to be obeyed. And obedience is not an option. Now, no man can fully obey the word of God. We fall short in many areas, and we fall short many times. But the earnest desire of the child of God is to follow God. The earnest desire of the, of the child of, of Christ is to follow him. And since Jesus is the Son of God, which the resurrection declares, then we must seek to follow his word. It's no good to say, I believe in Jesus, and to live absolutely contrary to him. He himself will say in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you give me sovereignty, if you will? Lord, Lord, and then you do not do what I say. In other words, the reality is to know Christ is to follow Christ. And to claim to be a Christian and not follow him is, is an oxymoron. It's a contrary statement. It doesn't make sense. It, it just is, it, it's a lie. Well, another thing, his being the son of God necessitates is that he be worshipped. He be worshipped. And he was worshipped in his life on earth. Right? In Matthew 2.11, we read the Magi coming to, after Mary gives birth, he's probably close to somewhere between one and a half and two years old. And, and the Magi come and we read, they bowed down and they worshipped him. Worshipped him. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, the week before he went to the cross, we read in Matthew 21, 9, then the multitudes who went before him, uh, then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the word Hosanna is a plea for salvation, an expression of adoration. So it was used by the crowd as a form of worship. Hosanna. Matthew 14, after Jesus amazes his disciples by walking on water, we read, those who were in the boat worshipped him. They worshipped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Matthew 28, 9, after his resurrection, Jesus meets some of the women and we read, so they came and they held him by his feet and they worshipped him. They worshipped him. When Thomas saw the risen Lord a week after his resurrection, the words he said was this. When he said, Thomas, don't be unbelieving, believe. Look at my hands, look at my side, it's me. My Lord and my God. And in none of these instances did Jesus tell them, no, stop, don't worship me, only God is worthy of worship, which is a true statement. He doesn't do that, you know why? Because he is God. He is God. He's worthy of worship. And, and, and we continue to offer worship to Jesus today by offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what Paul is saying in Romans 12, 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, believers, by the mercies of God that you do what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your bodies a living, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Live your life worshiping him. Don't just come here and sing songs. That's good, though. Don't just come here and pray prayers. That's good, though. Right? Your life, every day, worship him. Live for him. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. That's a, that's a life of worship. For me to live is Christ and to die, that's even better. That's gain. Because now I go to the one I worship here. He's worshiped. Listen, he's worshiped in heaven right now by the 24 elders and the angels. We read in, 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 in Hebrews 1, 6, and when he... And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And all men will bow before him. Listen, all men 
will bow before him when he returns. You understand, you understand that if people will not bow now, if they will not worship him with, with, with their lives and their heart and their words, there'll come a day where they will bow and they will confess it, right? There comes a day, we're told in, in Philippians 2.10, that in the end, here's the thing, he's the king, and whether we acknowledge it or not, he's the king, and the king will be worshiped. And so if today you won't do it, I'm not going to have him rule over me. I'm my own king. I'm the God of my life. I determine what I do. You determine what you do. But know this. On the last day, you will bow. And on the last day, you will confess that he is Lord. And then he'll throw you into the lake of fire. Right? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. God will be glorified when you recognize Christ as Lord, even though it's too late to be saved. We worship him, though, here and now. And the way we do that is by knowing him and communing with him and serving him and trusting him and praising him and making him known. Lastly, his being the son of God necessitates that we trust his promises. We trust them. And what did he promise us? Well, many promises, but I'll give you a few. In John 4, 13 and 14, he said to the woman by the well, he said, everyone who drinks of this water, literal water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And you're going to become, you're going to have a divine nature as the spirit of God indwells you. He said in John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And believe means to be born again. Believe means to surrender. Believe means to to say no to your sin and yes to him. Because a lot of people say, well, I believe. You know, I believe. I believe that chair will hold me up. But what does it mean? Believe means I give you my life. John 5.24, most assuredly, he said, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes, believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Speaking of his sheep in John 10, 28, he said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My friends, you understand the only thing, brothers and sisters, that we have as a sure hope is that we are in Christ's hand and nobody is opening his omnipotent hand and getting us out of there and and causing us to be lost. We're not opening it, nor is the devil opening it, nor is anyone else opening it. He's got us. He doesn't buy something with his own blood and then let it get lost willy-nilly. He keeps it. That's the promise. Three more times in the Gospel of John, he will say the same thing, that he gives his people eternal life. So because he lives forever, so do we. We will physically die, yes, but it is not the end. Not for a believer. Not for a believer. He has promised us eternal life and glory to come. And as the Son of God, who has all power and authority, he will fulfill it. And so the resurrection reveals Jesus' sonship. Secondly, from Romans 1.4, the resurrection reveals Jesus' power. Again, we read, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Well, his resurrection not only proved who he was, but also had power, the power that he possessed. And the word power in Greek here is the word dunamis, dunamis, which we get the English word dynamite from. Right? And it means literally supernatural explosive power, supernatural power. Uh, now, when we read... Uh, that he's declared to be the Son of God with power, that phrase with power modifies what comes before it, which is the Son of God. And that does not mean that Jesus was not the Son of God before the resurrection. He was. But because of the resurrection, he went from being the Son of God in lowliness and, and in human limitations, because remember, he's a man too, right? And he set aside his glory for a season while he walked this earth. And like you and I, as a man, you know, he had limitations. He wasn't everywhere all at once. He didn't have all power as a man. He didn't know all things as a man. As God, of course, he always did. 
but not as a man. But because of the resurrection, he went from being the son of God in loneliness and with human limitations to being the son of God with power, with power. This is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority, and that means power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I got it all. I've got it all. As the God man, I have it all. This is what Paul meant when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and 26, he, Jesus, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So in other words, with power means that Jesus is the reigning king over all the world right now. Right now. Ephesians 1.21 says that Christ is right now seated at the right hand of God. And to be seated at the right hand just means power. It means position of authority. There we read, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He's got it all. And we'll see it for sure and, and we'll see it in absolute, all its glory when he comes again. Well, this power that was proven at the resurrection shows itself in different ways. For one, it was the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Right? Now, some scriptures say that it was God's power that raised Jesus from the dead. In Romans 6, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. All right? Paul says God did it. Galatians 1.1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father, who raised him from the dead. So he says again, God did it. But some scripture says to us that Jesus, Jesus' power is the power that raised him from the dead. In John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. I mean, I have power to raise myself. And in Romans 8, 11, it says that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, that's the Holy Spirit, who, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who lives in you. So then who is it? Which is it? Which is true? Was it the Father? Was it the Son? Was it the Spirit? They all did. It's all true. Remember that the Father and the Son and the Spirit share the exact same attributes. They're all God. And that includes their power. Jesus told the Jewish leaders that he would indeed resurrect himself in John 2.19. He said, destroy this temple, meaning his body, destroy this temple, and in three days, in three days, I will raise it up. Now, they, of course, thought he was talking about a building. He's talking about his body. Destroy it, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, his resurrection proves that he not only had power to raise himself, but he also had the power to raise spiritually dead sinners, that he had the power to bring them to spiritual life. In Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, even when we were dead in trespasses, that means we were spiritually dead. We were not alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in trespasses, right? He made us alive together with Christ by grace who have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, Christ is risen and he is alive. And he is in the heavenly places right now seated at the right hand of God. And because we are alive in him, we have been raised up with him. Listen, God has approved of his son's work and therefore he is righteous in his sight and the resurrection proves that. And if God has raised up, and, 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 and if God has raised up uh, uh, Jesus, then by virtue of our union with him, we too are approved in God's sight. Romans 4.25 declares that by, by saying that Jesus was raised because of our justification, he was raised for our justification, meaning for our standing, holy, righteous standing before God. He was raised for that, and we have it in him. 1 Peter 1.3 says this. Peter tells us that it was by the power of the resurrection we have new life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, born from above, has begotten us again to a living hope. How did he do that? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right? We're born again and have eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, and, and not only does this power regenerate us, but it is available to us from the time that it regenerates us through our whole Christian life until he takes us home. Colossians 2, 11 and 12 says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The moment, the moment a sinner is saved, they have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to help them to put off the bodies the body of sins of the flesh. Paul greatly desired this power. This is the power Paul wanted to live for Christ. Philippians 3.10. Paul said, he goes, that I may know him. I want to know Jesus better and better. And the power of his resurrection. I want to know it. I want to experience it. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his image. I want to know his power because that's the only way I can live for him. That's the only way I can have the joy and peace of God. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask would think, according to the power that works in us. Brothers and sisters, that power works in us. And again in Ephesians 6.10, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So what Paul is saying is that because of the power that was declared at the resurrection, we now have power not to yield to sin. Romans 6, 11, he said, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, because of that, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. See what he's saying? We're alive in Christ and the power of God is ours to live holy lives. So Christ's resurrection and his power is there to equip us to fight against the flesh and against the devil. And it motivates us, it motivates us to persevere and to keep forsaking sin. And it helps us to focus on the heavenly reward because we're thinking on things above. And that causes us to eagerly wait for Christ's return when he will demonstrate his power. Here it is, by transforming our lowly bodies and conforming them to his glorious body. Do you understand that, brothers and sisters, that this body you own now, this flesh and blood that you have now, right? You get a little older, some of you guys know, it kind of gets frail, right? Right? And, and, and we can't put stock in it. I just did a funeral like three days ago. And, and I've been to too many of them. And if I live another 30 years, I'll go to a bunch more. But these bodies are not the end all. He's going to, listen, he's already resurrected your soul if you're a believer. You already have the spirit of God in you. You're spiritually alive. But here's the thing. Your body and soul, right? And he didn't come just for the soul. He came for the body too. And when he comes back at the second coming, he's going to raise that dead body from the grave to meet that spirit that's already in heaven and he's going to bring them together. One body, one soul, one resurrected, glorified being. And he has the power to do it. Just like he is right now. Romans 8, 11. 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You may die physically, but that's not the end. Now, this power not only brings us to life spiritually, and it not only sustains us, uh, and, it, and it not only will resurrect us on the last day, but, but it, it is also what God uses to convict sinners. Over and over and over again, the sermons preached by the apostles in the book of Acts always ended with the resurrection of Christ. Always ended with the resurrection. Let me give you a few. Acts 2. Peter, this Jesus, God has raised up 
of which we are witnesses. Acts 3, Peter again. You killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. Acts 4. Let it be known to you all and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by this man stands here before you whole. The guy they raised up uh, by the temple. Acts 5. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on the tree. Acts 10. We are all witnesses of these things, which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him, him, God raised up on the third day. In Acts 13, 29 and 30. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him up from the dead. You have no resurrection. You have no gospel. You have no message. You have no hope. So the resurrection has the power to convict the greatest skeptic and the hardest heart. It was the only sign that Jesus would give the naysayers in his day. Show us a sign, show us a sign. We want to see a sign. Do some great miracle. Do something in the skies that only, only God could do. And Jesus knew what they were saying. He knew they didn't believe him, even if he did that. Even if he made 13,000 stars come together and make some bright shining light, he knew they wouldn't believe. So here's what he said. He said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he says, what happened with Jonah? For as Jonah was in, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, it's only three days because then I'm going to resurrect. That's the sign. That's the sign. So then the resurrection has the power to convict sinners because where there is life, there is hope. And there is no hope in any religious person. And there is no hope in, in religious institutions. There is only hope in Christ. In Christ. Listen, there is no hope in Islam because Muhammad is dust in the grave. There is no hope in Buddhism. There is no hope in Catholicism. There is no hope in any of these things. There is only hope in Christ. All religious men who claim to be something, all religious systems that claim to be something, they're just waiting for judgment. But the one who trusts in Christ, they've been judged already. And they were judged at the cross. And they're not going to be judged again because Christ has paid it and paid it in full. So there's no hope in religion or religious people. But Christ is alive. And he is alive with power. And his power is over everything and everyone, including you and me. And his resurrection proves it. Well, in closing, let me leave you with three exhortations. And the first one is to believers. And that is this. Christ's resurrection demands our complete loyalty. His resurrection demands our complete loyalty. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, we read, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who should live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. We live for the one who's alive now. Brothers and sisters, our lives are not our own. They belong to Christ. He died for us and he rose again for us. Therefore, we should no longer be living for ourselves. Therefore, every aspect of our lives should be dedicated to him. Again, he's not some dead religious hero who we're claiming to follow. No, he is Christ, the risen Lord. And he is the only one who is worthy of our worship and of our continual worship at that. And not to offer up everything, including our very lives to him, is to speak poorly of the one that God has highly exalted. And this ought not to be a burden for his people. Oh, it's such a burden to follow Jesus. It's such a burden to live him. It ought not to be because we possess the very spirit of God and we have his peace and his joy and his fruit and his strength. John will say in 1 John 5, and we follow his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Why? Because we love him. Why? Because he loved us. And when you love someone, it is no real task to do things for them and to love them. Second exhortation 
is live by the power of Christ's resurrection. Live by the power of his resurrection. We will fail miserably if we try to live the Christian life in our own power. Right? We cannot be conformed to the image of Christ by human effort. It does not work that way. Right? You, you cannot be victorious over sin and Satan in your own body, in your own strength. Right? You cannot surrender your will to God will, God's will by your willpower. Oh, I'm just going to do it. You can't do it. Your sin nature will not allow you to do it. No, Christians need the power that raised Christ from the grave to live the new life. We need resurrection power to take up our crosses and to follow him. We need resurrection power to declare Christ to a Christless society. We need resurrection power to, to love the unsaved, to love an unsaved spouse, right? To, to, to love our enemies as ourselves, to endure suffering and trials and hardship. We can't do it on our own. It's not possible. But here's the thing. He gives it. You come to him, he's giving it to you. He's lavishing his power and grace upon you so you could glorify him. My third exhortation is to the unsaved, to those who are not born again today. And that is, Christ's resurrection demands your complete surrender. Christ's Christ's resurrection demands your complete surrender. Listen, if Jesus had stayed in the grave then quite honestly, just keep living the way you're living. Don't worry about it. Just keep sinning, drinking, drugs, womanizing, manizing, or whatever you're doing. Keep lying, stealing, cheating, coveting, hating. Keep it going. All is well if he didn't rise from the grave. Then it's just a religion. And it's like every other religion. You know, give it some lip service. Doesn't really make much of a difference. Even be friendly towards Christianity. Keep coming here if you want. Right? Keep looking like a friend of Christ, but inwardly, here's the deal. You are an enemy of Christ. But Christ has risen from the dead, and he has done so with power, declaring that he is the Son of God and declaring that he has all power and authority. And that authority enables him to condemn you for not believing in him and not surrendering to him. And that authority enables him to cast you into the lake of fire for refusing to repent of your sins and believe in him. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus means there's no escape for you on the last day. Understand, because he is alive, you got to deal with him. you got to deal with him. And if you don't want to deal with him now, on, on the authority of the word of God, I can assure you, you will see him on the last day. And it's not going to be pretty. And he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as your judge. And he will condemn you. And no one's going to be arguing with him or trying to debate with him or somehow trying to work their way out of the condemnation coming their way. And the reason he'll do that is because you have refused to submit to Christ for life and for forgiveness of your sins. Now, I know many give him lip service. Maybe today you're even duped. You've duped yourself into thinking, all is well between me and Christ. Hey, I go to church, crack open a Bible once in a while, say a prayer or two, throw a few shekels into the plate. But it's not, because you haven't surrendered. You see, he wants the life. He wants the life. You haven't surrendered to him. And I'm pleading with you today to throw up the white flag and surrender to the resurrected Christ. Beg him to have mercy on you. Plead with him to forgive you of all your sin. Come to the king on his throne this way, and guess what? He will extend the scepter, meaning he'll say, okay, come. I allow you to come to me. I want you to come to me. I've made a way for you to come to me. Come. Come to me and see how kind I am. See how merciful I am. See how loving I am. See how benevolent I am. And I am a king that I will not abdicate my throne. I don't walk away from nobody. I love the Father, the Father loves me, I love my people, they love me. And he has the power and the authority to resurrect you from the spiritually dead and to give you everlasting life, amen? Amen. Come to him, confess your sin, cry out, be humble, go low, and he'll raise you up high. Let's pray as the ushers come forward. Father, the most amazing thing is that you would save even one soul how no one deserves such mercy and grace. And yet you have chosen to love us because you have chosen to love us and for no other reason. And Lord, the offer goes out to all men to come 
and to cry out for forgiveness and to trust in Christ. And Lord, the one who trusts in you, you will save. So Father, I pray as your people, we would think much on the sonship of Christ, who he is, what he has done, and Lord, and what that implies. And Lord, I pray that we would remember that he has all power, that we can do nothing in ourselves. We need him. And Lord, for the soul or souls here even this day that are not truly saved, aren't born again, are not in the kingdom, they're running hard against you. Lord, I pray you would arrest them in their souls or give them no peace in their heart, O oh God, until they come to Christ and they bow before Christ and find life in Christ. And Father, we thank you that we could give back to you as you have given us your son, your very own son, so that we could have life. I pray that we would be joyful givers, cheerful givers, hilarious givers. Uh, Lord, we would give to further your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.